there is something called network attached storage, storage area network, which are like storage boxes, where you can store any amount of data. But that will not solve my problem because I can connect this server with a SAN, let's say a storage area network, and in the SAN I can probably store 1000 terabyte, no doubt. But I can only store, I cannot process. SAN can be used for a variety of other purposes actually, to store the data, right? And NAS also, I mean NAS also doesn't work. So this part is gone. So, so the question is that what people were actually doing when they had data, right? So I, I showed you the traditional architecture where the data warehouse was there, right? Okay. Ah. The data warehouse is nice, but the only problem it is costly, right? So data warehousing is actually a very nice concept. You can store good amount of data, even 1000 terabyte, more than that you can store. But the only problem it is very costly. So we have uh, vendors like Teradata. So there is a vendor called Teradata. Green Plum, Netizar, there are many vendors actually. But I cannot pay you. So that is a requirement. So they will come back to where and said, sir, we have an excellent solution which will work for you. What is the solution? You store 500 terabyte, the rest you archive. They'll, give, they'll sell an archival solution along with that. What is the problem? If you archive your data, then what? You can't use it for you can't use it. You can get it for real-time analytics, right? Exactly. So that is what people are actually doing. So they will archive majority of the data. Remaining data you analyze. Whatever you get, you analyze, right? So now when it comes to the big data technologies, what we usually do is that instead of taking one machine, we take a group of machines. So I just draw four machines. That is not the number. But we take a group of machines and we create something called a cluster. A cluster is nothing but a group of machines, to put it very simply. And let's say we are taking four machines as an example. Okay, So I take four machines and then I form a cluster. So the question may be that how do you form a cluster? Will it come out of thin air? No. You have to use a framework. So that is where this thing called Hadoop and all are very popular. So there is something called Hadoop. Hadoop is probably the most uh, used big data framework in the world as of now. Hadoop is a platform. Okay. So if you are using Hadoop, what you can do? You can say take four machines, install Hadoop in all of them. You have a ways to do it. Once you install Hadoop in all of them, what Hadoop can do is that, let's say each machine is having 10 terabyte of hard disk. It can project a total storage of, let's say, 40 terabyte, combining all these four uh, machines hard disk, right? Not only that, it can start from here. You can start with four machines and you can expand to 40 or 400 or even 4,000 machines without disturbing the cluster. So you are never going to run out of space, right? So the more data you have, you keep adding more machines. And I'm talking about a very typical setup, okay? So uh, normal Hadoop clusters are anywhere between 50 to 1,000, 2,000 nodes, right? For example, uh, there's a company called 24 by 7 nearby in Bangalore. They are a call center, BPO company, right? They do a lot of analytics, 24 by 7. They have a Hadoop cluster. They run 60 nodes in the Hadoop cluster. That is their uh, setup, right? On the other hand, Bank of America has a Hadoop cluster that is 2,000 machines because Bank of America is bigger, of course, and they have a huge amount of data. So now you may ask, building this setup to store my data, still I have a cost problem. So if I'm building a 60 node Hadoop cluster, imagine, are you really investing money for 60 nodes? Yes. In that case, how this is cheaper because you have to buy 60 machines. You have to connect them, right? Uh, electricity and everything. So that's not really a cost effective way to do, right? It is cost effective because all these machines I'm using, they are commodity hardware. There is something called commodity hardware. Commodity hardware, I will call it. Commodity hardware means cheap machines or assembled machines or second-hand machines. You are not building enterprise-grade systems. 
So point number one, you are not going to invest a lot of money for hardware. So the philosophy of Hadoop says that if you are building a Hadoop cluster, find the cheapest machines possible and build it. That means these machines are not really reliable. They can crash, they can go down at any point in time because they are not really reliable. And there is a way Hadoop will take care of it. So that's a different question. But you are not really going to invest a lot of money into buying hardware. You are not going to buy like 60 IBM Blade servers to build a Hadoop cluster. Then you will practically run out of money end of the, uh, this thing, right? So the machines are commodity. Now I should also tell you what is happening in the industry, right? So what is happening in the industry? So this is probably the theory which I was teaching like 10 years back. Even now it is valid, okay? But now there is a huge difference. This is the difference. Cloud, right? Everything is on cloud. Everything, I mean, I'm not kidding. <laughs> it's real. <laughs> Even the people believe it is not real, it is real, right? And that has a lot of impacts actually, right? So these days, the majority of Hadoop clusters are on cloud. Around 60 to 70 percentage Hadoop clusters are on cloud. On-premise clusters are very rare. In fact, I've seen very, so I also work with this company called GE, General Electric. Their entire platform is on cloud, including their financial data lake, finance data. So previously people had these concerns like, if I go to cloud, what will happen to my data? Some hacker will hack in and those are all concerns. Doesn't matter. It's over. 10 years back, you can ask that question. Everything is on cloud now. I mean, different vendors will have their different perspective. Some people will still say that due to security reasons, I don't want to go, but majority of the people have migrated. So most of these clusters are now in the cloud, which means again, it is cheaper. You know how cloud works, right? It's a pay as you go service. So you can get any type of machines you want and you only pay hourly basis or whenever, how much you are using, right? So, and you can resize your cluster, all these advantages you get. So, and, and so that's what I'm saying. So in the very recent days, uh, I have seen a lot of customers migrating to cloud or using cloud-based Hadoop infrastructure. I will show you this practically. So ideally, I'm supposed to talk for only theory stuff and that's fine, but I also thought I'll show you something just so that you can understand. I'll show you a cluster, um, which we already have. And I will also show you how easy it is to create a cluster in the cloud. Like anybody can do it. It's not a big deal, but you know, if somebody want to build a cluster, how you can actually do it. I will show you that, right? So, so these factors will actually bring down the cost of your hardware. So you're not really spending a lot of money. So it's like you know, somebody else is giving this service and you are taking it. Cloud. Ah. Yeah, like Amazon, for example, Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud or Azure or any, any, anybody. You sign up with them. So they have their machine that creates that virtual environment. And exactly. So they have their data center. And you can scale. I've just started ah. because at my company. So we pay around 40,000 rupees for 20 terabytes of data. Ah. So uh, the thing is that you just go to them and say that, you can get the service in different ways. You can get compute service, storage service, or anything as a service. And another term which people use a lot is something called data lake. And that's also very popular. There is something called a data lake. Well, this is not a lot to do with big data, but I just thought probably there is something called a data lake. Okay. I don't know how to define a data lake to be very honest because the technical definitions are very difficult to understand. A data lake is a common place where you get all the different varieties of the data in its original glory. So basically you can build a data lake. Like I think you are working on a data lake on Azure, right? So you get all the kind of different data. So these cloud platforms, what they do, they will offer this data lake as a service like Azure or Amazon. So they will say that we will give you a data lake. What is a data lake? Nothing. They will give you the data in its original format, all the data in one place. From there, you can start uh, uh, taking your data and doing whatever you want. So it's a common platform where all the data will lie. That's called a data lake. Yeah, so data warehouse is more or less like for structured data. Like you have tables and then um, 
you write SQL queries. So data warehouse is always confined to structured data and as well as you are more or less writing SQL queries on the data. And a data lake is a place where you also have structured data and unstructured data, any type of data that is coming from different, different sources. And then people can connect with the data lake and make use of the data. So probably if I am a guy who is coming from SQL background, I can connect with the data lake and I can say create a table and I just want to query the data. But maybe if I am coming from machine learning background, I don't want to write a SQL, I can say read all these text files and I want to do my EDA and then build my machine learning model or something. But basically data lake is a place where all your data lies in its original format you know, and then you decide what to do with the data. So it's a service that is being offered these days. Uh, yeah, all the cloud vendors offer it as a service basically. Right? So I am more familiar with uh, Amazon Web Services uh, than the other cloud vendors but all of them are having similar uh, ways of doing it. Like you also have Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, IBM, all these cloud vendors, right? Yeah, so there is no archiving in, in this platform. It is uh, available, readily available. If you want, you can archive. Now, that's what, uh, when you go to the cloud, you pay for something called the storage handlers, like how they are storing the data. So you can decide, so if I go to Amazon, uh, Amazon has something called S3. That is their storage, primary storage. And that is the cheapest uh, storage Amazon give you. So Amazon will tell you, tell you that, hey, you know what, all the data you want to store, I will give you S3. You dump all the data in S3. But what they don't tell you is that, then once you start dumping the data, they will say that, in S3, I will give you three options. Uh, do you want in uh, magnetic hard disk? Do you want it in SSD? Or do you want something else? If you want SSD, I'll charge you more. If you want magnetic, I'll charge you less. Okay, so still you figure out, okay, you want magnetic. But again, you're getting a lot of data. So then Amazon will say that, hey, your bill is pretty high, and I don't know whether you'll be able to pay. So we'll give you an option. We'll ask you to archive the data. We'll give you Glacier. Glacier is their product for archiving. So they will say that in S3 we'll keep your data, but if the data becomes one year old, we'll automatically move to Glacier, archive the data. So Glacier is cheaper. So the customer can decide. So there is something called life cycle policy. Customer can decide if my data becomes one year old, what should I do with it? Should I delete it? Should I move to archive? Should I keep it here? Charges will be there. And, and what the cloud providers do not tell you, because we had a lot of bad experiences, is that Everybody moved to the cloud thinking cloud is cheaper, which is not, in fact. Yeah, and, and the biggest thing is that if you are keeping your data in cloud, for uploading the data, there is no charge. For downloading, you, you will be charged. So, in majority of the cloud platforms, when you upload the data, it's free. Free in the sense you have to pay for the storage, but if, let's say, I uploaded a picture somewhere, and if, let's say, 1 million people viewed the picture, they will charge for this 1 million views because that is a data transfer out of their uh, cloud, right? So, so these charges you will not see unless you see your bill, right? So then you're like, what did I say? So you will come back to them and say, I am just paying S3 only $500 and you give me a bill of 5,000? So they will say the remaining is data transfer charges. So then you start learning, okay, there is data transfer charges, okay? So then you start quoting. So we had a lot of bad experience with this. I mean, all the running cluster for sure they charge, but for data transfer they should charge. I guess if you are uh, so let's say you are keeping the data in some platform, and if you are taking it out of their cloud, they will charge per uh, amount of data they will charge. Let's figure it out. Right? So nobody has any clue how this is working. So end of the day, you pay the bill, right? So. So, but data transfers are charged in the cloud usually. That is how it is working. What is happening in the cloud is more than the cost, it's the elasticity. Right. Right? The manageability of the data centers and the infrastructure is becoming a more costly affair Correct. than the hardware itself. Correct. So now these cloud companies are actually giving you the hardware huh. plus the manageability. Right. And which is much cheaper. Correct. So exactly. That's where the, the benefit of the cloud is coming. Right. So, uh, 
like rightly said, one of the advantages of cloud is elasticity, which you cannot get on premise. Like all of a sudden, you 100 machines, you cannot buy it, you get it on the cloud. The second thing is the manageability part, where everything is managed by the provider, for sure, right? Yeah, speed and all are uh, also fine, and you get numerous services uh, free on the cloud. So they're fine. I mean, I'm not blaming the cloud. Everybody is on the cloud, so there is no way to blame it. But uh, a lot of hidden charges are there, which people don't understand. When they learn cloud, or even if you visit the uh, provider's website, some of the charges they won't even reveal, and you have to fight for them. They will negotiate, trust me. So you will go to them and say that, okay, you're charging $5,000, I'm going to move out to Azure, they will say, we'll reduce the charge for you. So for a lot of times we had experience, like we personally fight, we were using Amazon, but that's a story with every uh, vendor. Sometimes you fight with them and say that, you know, I'm, not, I'm going to another vendor. So they will say, that will be very well for three months. <laughs> so in these three months, you understand how to cut down your charges. But end of the day, it is much cheaper than on-premise. You are building something on-premise is very costly. Your own data center and all, right? So, but yeah, but cloud always becomes a topic even when you are discussing uh, big data and all, right? So, in this case, Amazon and Google, they have uh, they need to have huge storage. Yeah, exactly. They have. They have. Across. They have. They have big big aircrafts. So Azure data centers are uh, the size of a football field, actually. And they have, I don't know, how many, 100 plus like that, server farms they have. So this Amazon's S3 is a very interesting service because your entire Instagram and uh, Dropbox is on S3. Think about it. So what will be the size they are handling? Entire Instagram and Dropbox is stored in S3. And that is just like 0.1 percentage of storage in Amazon of S3. That is just two clients. So S3 is probably the most widely used storage service in the world. Nobody can beat it because they started first. Actually, for enterprise, Azure is more reliable. Ah, for public uh, access, S3 is more uh, because it's a very cheap actually. Drag and drop. Kind of. Azure also. So now, yeah, sorry. Startup company. Uh, for them to kind of enter into big data, probably start looking at big data. Huh. Is there any kind of, uh, if you have seen the 10 year evolution of how big data has transformed, is there any benefit analysis that is kind of there that, okay, that will probably let these startup companies kind of invest in that? Uh, yes. So, the, um, so previously what uh, startup companies used to do, they used to build their own Hadoop cluster and all, which was very costly. But now, um, in uh, in the cloud perspective, there are some solutions which, I will show you one solution, I was about to show that. Amazon has a solution called EMR, it stands for Elastic MapReduce, wherein that is specifically for like startup companies or companies who do not want to run a full-fledged Hadoop cluster. So we had a customer, it was an Australian client, they were an e-commerce uh, company, they were a startup. Their problem is, they are already in Amazon. Their website, everything is in Amazon. And uh, they have a lot of data stored in Amazon. So they are happy with the storage, but now they want to use Hadoop and Spark and all for analysis. So that means they have to create a cluster, which they are not ready, because they don't want to spend a lot of money in creating a cluster and analyzing the cluster and all. So that is where uh, this solution called EMR can help you. Help you. EMR is actually a disposable service, meaning you go to Amazon and ask Amazon that I want a Hadoop cluster in five minutes. So Amazon will ask how many machines, you say 100 machines. They will create a Hadoop cluster, install everything and give you let's say 100 machines in five to 10 minutes. And let's say you get the cluster, you run it for one hour. In this one hour, you analyze whatever you want to do, you do analytics and all, delete it, terminate it. So it is like a disposable service. And you are paying only for one hour. Very cheap, right? Because otherwise I have to manage these 100 machines throughout the year, that is not required. So Azure service is called HD Insight. Maybe you could have heard about it. There is a service called HD Insight. Very similar. And Google Cloud has Dataproc. That's also similar. So they are like um, clusters which can be created on the fly. And you can keep them for a shorter period of time, maybe two days, three days also. But there is no way you can stop them. Once you create them, you have to delete them. 
unless there will be huge charge. So for ad hoc analysis, like startup companies and all, they do this. And another advantage is that normally when somebody is creating a Hadoop cluster, you need the knowledge how to install Hadoop, how to set up Hadoop, which people may not know, right? In this, Amazon will do everything for you. So you just need the knowledge of a developer, right? And everything will be installed and configured and given to you. You just have to use the service. So you practically do not need an administrator. So it's a very uh, manageable service. I'll show you how to create an EMR cluster. It's very easy actually to do. And then you can start playing around with it. So there is one service which even uh, some of my previous clients were uh, interested in doing because they were not ready to run a full full time Hadoop cluster. So they want it. Whenever they want, they will create it and they will do the analysis, then they will delete it end of the day. Right? No, that is where we are wrong. Startup company may not have its data, but it will have a lot of public data. Say they want to analyze the social media trend, right? That is common for everybody, right? So the social media data will be huge, which anybody can download. But to download that and analyze that, they need a Hadoop cluster. So they can create something like this on the fly, probably a small cluster, analyze it, and then delete it if they don't want data. So one, one use case, I'm saying. Some, um, so a lot of people are there who are interested in analyzing a lot of public data, right? To predict what is happening, what is not happening, etc. Right. Uh, this um, we had a in this great learning we had a project not in BABI. We have a AML course, artificial intelligence and machine learning. There people have done a project of uh, judgment uh, summarization this low, what you call crime, right? So you have this judgments by the Supreme Court and uh, High Court and all, right? So what happens when the judgment comes, right? Uh, the judgment is very big, like 200 pages, 300 pages. So let's say this Shabarimala verdict or something happened. So if somebody want to read it, it's like 300 pages. You can't read, I mean, you can, but you have to spend a lot of time. So they built a machine learning model, which will summarize this into one page. The system will automatically read, basically text analytics, and then it will summarize to one page. So they did it as a part of their project here, and I think then they moved to, uh, uh, you know, uh, building it as a company. They started it as a startup company. Because that idea is very interesting. They got funded also, I think. Now, the, these guys were getting, so what I'm saying, it's a startup company, but they were having huge amount of data. They were collecting the low related data from India and US and so many other countries. So the amount of data they were getting was very huge actually. Not, so even though it's a startup, the data they wanted to manage was very high actually, right? So they had discussed with me some solutions, whether we can use data warehousing or something to store the data and then later use it and all. We had a short discussion. I think we started the company. It's in Chennai. The bash was in Chennai, and I think the company is also in Chennai. That's a very interesting. You you guys also have a project, right? 